One, two, three, four. Hi, I'm Melanie Banks, Manager Heritage Programming with the Heritage Services Department, and I'm here to tell you more about the city's museums, collections, educational programming, and more. Hello, hello. Thank you for listening in today. We've got a brand new episode of Tell Me More. I'm your host, Autumn Hume, and today we're diving into the world of Kingston's heritage programming. This seemingly specific phrase actually encompasses a pretty diverse category of events, workshops, exhibits, and much, much more. So we'll take a look at how the city's museums, exhibits, and tours come together and what's in store for 2024 and beyond, maybe? Um, Hi, Melanie, and welcome. Um, To start us off, could you tell us a bit about what your department does at the city? Um, Heritage programming. We're not talking like like computers and coding and stuff, are we? <laughs> no, we're not talking about computers or coding. Fantastic. <laughs> the Heritage Programming Team is a part of the larger Heritage Service team. The team works with a ri- wide range of projects within Heritage. We operate the city-owned museums, provide city hall guided tours, deliver educational programming at these sites, curate exhibits, and preserve and care for the artifacts and art displayed throughout the buildings, as well as work on the maintenance and care of the larger public art pieces that you see outdoor around Kingston. Jeez, that's a, that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot of stuff. So I'm just wondering how, how that splits from the other heritage services. So what's the difference there between you and, and sort of the, the other half of the department? The other side of the department is heritage planning, and they work with he- built heritage. Okay. So the buildings that you see around Kingston, uh, typically privately owned buildings. Um, right. So like buildings versus the activities happening inside of our, our museums. Exactly, stuff. yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so... I want to just jump onto the arts, the public art piece that you mentioned in your intro there, um, just as a starting point. I thought that was handled by our arts and culture team. What's what's your role in that? It's a bit of a joint project. Oh, arts cool. and cultural services plays the leading role in developing new public art pieces, working with the artists and developing the relationships. They uh, help with the installation, and once the art is complete and installed, it becomes a part of the outdoor public art collection, which is then managed and maintained by Heritage Services. Oh, okay. So, like the big ones on the um, on the lakeshore there. I'm a, I'm a big fan of the pollution one. <laughs> I think a lot of people are. <laughs> yes, that's one of our pieces. Okay. As well as time down there as well. Right. Okay. Um, well, that's okay. So thanks for clearing that up. Um, I just want to keep things moving uh, with the list of stuff that you mentioned. Let's see. Let's talk about museums. Um, Which ones does the city manage and what does that entail? The city owns two museums, the the Pump House Museum, as well as McLaughlin Woodworking Museum. And we also manage City Hall as a National Historic Site. Pump House is open year round um, with a permanent exhibition displaying and interpreting the space as Kingston's first waterworks. Mm -hmm. We also have a permanent train exhibition and this is the Discovery Center where we host educational programming and there are interactives and activities for learners of all ages to engage with. The last space we have at the Pump House is a rotating exhibition space. In a typical year, we bring in a new exhibition each year and build programming and educational workshops around the space. Our current exhibition is The Stuff Stories Are Made Of. This exhibition showcases 200 plus objects from all of our different collections, hanging art and artifacts side by side to demonstrate the wide range of collection that the city cares for. Interesting. It's kind of like a greatest hits of city artifacts. Exactly. (laughs) Cool. We like to think so. (laughs) I got to say, I'm a big fan of the train room. It's kind of a long standing pump house, I think. (laughs) It's fun. Everyone seems to love that space. (laughs) Um, Okay, so... We, you alluded a bit to uh, the work that's underway for 2024 and sort of the current of the current ex- exhibit that's uh, at the Pump House right now. But can you talk a bit about more about um, what you're planning, about what might be coming down the pipe in that way? Absolutely. The big exhibition we have coming up in 2024, which I'm personally excited about, is Soil Superheroes. It's on loan from Ingenium in Toronto. Okay. And it's going to be on display from early June at Pump House Museum. So soil. Um, that's a big topic. <laughs> I'm a gardener, and I know it doesn't take long at all to figure out that soil is foundational. Um, Could you tell us a bit more about this exhibit uh, was dive into? Yeah, absolutely. The exhibition asks visitors to explore why soil is important, how it provides medicine and food, clean water, and helps in the fight against climate change. As an added bonus, the exhibition has some fun characters, superhero characters that young learners will find engaging and fun. Um, so how, how does an exhibit like this come about? You said it's, um, kind of like a traveling exhibit, a touring exhibit from another museum. Yes, that's right. So 
within our department, we plan usually five years out for exhibitions. Five years. Yeah. <laughs> A lot goes into planning an exhibition, um, especially an in-house one. Mm-hmm. The traveling exhibitions tend to be planned out um, on a longer time scale as well for different museums. So we do have to plan pretty far out to make sure that we can get our hands on those exhibitions. Are you competing with other museums for bookings then for those ones? Yes, or? we are. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so how, how long have you known that this one was coming or how how far out did you have to plan for this one this one we've only planned out for a couple years it did come up the Mm -hmm. space availability so we did bring this one in just a few years ago okay so just sort of jump on the opportunities as well exactly yeah present themselves um and sorry you might have mentioned that when does it run again when's um soil coming soil superheroes starts in early june at the Mm -hmm. pump house museum perfect okay um so talked a bit about sort of what goes into getting an exhibit. You guys are planning this out on a five-year basis. Um, how do you decide what, 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 what exhibits to pick? Um, is there a particular theme or how do you decide what to focus on each year? Is it just availability or? It tends to be some, some part availability, but also what we think and we work with the community think will be engaging. Mm-hmm. Um, we do surveys at, each exhibition to see what people are finding interesting, what people want oh, to hear right. from us in the future. Uh, so we do take all of that into account and then see what what's available, what's coming up, and also what we have in our own collection to build our own in-house exhibitions. In the last in-house exhibition, um, I guess that's the one that's running right now. And then before that, it was the transportation one. And Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, so how is it like a cycle where we do like a couple years of in-house and then... Um, And then a traveling exhibition? Yes, we do a couple years of um, in-house exhibitions and then a traveling one. The next couple years we are doing traveling exhibitions because we are still waiting for the ink to dry on contracts, so I can't name them just yet, unfortunately. (laughs) That was what I was going to (laughs) ask. No, that's fair. That's that's fair. I don't want to shoot you guys in the foot at all with that, but yeah, excited to hear what those ones might be. Um, and I assume there's a lot of work that goes into uh, the exhibitions that we put together, like a lot of research time set up. A lot of research. We yeah. have a great team um, in the heritage programming side of the house that works um, on the curation side mm-hmm. to research, talk to the local community, um, and design that exhibition. So everything from choosing the objects, writing the text that's going to go along with it, translating those texts, printing them. Uh, we have this, our civic collection technician who builds the mounts and the cases for all those objects that they're going to go in oh, and wow. figures out how to mount them to the walls or hang them securely in spots. Um, and then on the education operations side of the house, our team is building out programming that goes along with those exhibits, mm-hmm. as well as designing new special events throughout the year that we're going to hold that that speak to that exhibition. The educational events um, or programming, is that working with schools, working in schools? or They do a little bit of everything. Uh-huh. So throughout our different sites, um, at the McLaughlin, we do woodworking workshops. So we do everything from paddle making with... Um, with um, a little bit of an older age group to more younger learners, Sword and Shield. And at Sword and Shield, it's a lot of fun. The kids get to build uh, a Sword and Shield, and then they... Okay. <laughs> I was wondering if that was a literal name. It's literal, yeah. That's and then great. at the end of it, they, they have an instructor that actually te- them, teaches them sword fighting. Really? Yes. Okay, yeah. And what ages is this for? <laughs> Uh, it's, it's actually a lot of adults have asked us to do an adult version, but so it's kind of, it's really open to all ages, but typically we do like about eight to, to 13, 14. Right. That makes sense. That makes sense. So, you know, if you've got young, younger kids, I guess, uh, yeah, we don't really close it to any age group, but that's the typical age that's that you're, we see. you're yeah. aiming for. That makes sense. That makes sense. The paddle making one. I'm glad you mentioned that. That's a, that's a popular one. Eh? That's one I've seen, um, come back year over year. Could you tell me a bit more about that one? Yeah, we do gear that to a bit more of a mature audience, but we have had younger learners come and do that one as well. Um, so it's an all-day workshop. We have a really great instructor that comes in. His name's Walt. He also has a uh, paddling business. So nice. he does lots of backwoods, um, over overnight retreats, doing paddle paddling and um, exploring that. So he's uh, a wood turner as well, and we've had him come on for the last couple of years, and he's been great at um, just teaching historic traditional methods of woodworking and, and helping build those paddles. And so at the end of it, you actually, you walk away with, uh, your own homemade paddle. Like functional, like I could canoe with it. You can canoe with it. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I see why these are maybe so popular. 
Um, that's very interesting. So when you talk about um, traditional methods, uh, what do you mean by that? So we don't use uh, any power tools. We all u- we use ha- hand planes. So oh. yeah, yeah. Okay, that's very neat. So it's a, it's a lot of work. It, it's a, actually an eight-hour eight workout. Jeez. A lot of sanding, I would imagine. Yes. <laughs> um, that's great. I wanted to ask about the McLaughlin Museum. That's sort of shifted since the pandemic. That's now... Um, is it is it just an event space? Is it planning to reopen as a regular museum? Or are we... What's the, Do you know what the future holds for that facility? The space has transitioned since the pandemic to largely a woodworking um, programming space. Okay, yeah. Uh, just to meet the need and the demand for those events and workshops that we've been holding there. Mm-hmm. And we've seen great turnout the McLaughlin for those programs. Unfortunately, the museum wasn't seeing uh, a, an uptake on visitors for a traditional museum, so we have tr- transitioned it, the space into a woodworking programming space. That's a great use, a great reuse of the space. It then, is, if, yeah. that, if that's what it's, you know, that's where we're seeing people's interest. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I wanted to jump back into old buildings and the work that you do to. Uh, put artifacts in them specifically city hall the building where we're recording this right now it's big it's iconic historically and contemporarily significant um so what role does your team play in keeping it a living building yeah my team's responsible for all the niche cases you th- see throughout city hall so those are the small cases that are kind of set into the walls oh, okay uh right now one of them holds the mayor's chain of office pretty close to the mayor's office uh and the others speak to the local community's history in the area I've seen some of the exhibits in City Hall swap out every once in a while. So would that be in response to things or do you have a schedule that you keep to? Or We do. Four of the niche cases are part of the Your Stories, Our Histories program, uh, which does a call out to the community to ask them to respond and uh, help us build a case. So we in May will be doing that for the first time in a little while since the pandemic. And we'll be bringing in four new cases, which um, will be announced in the coming weeks as well. Exciting. So in addition to the exhibits, the niches in, and the artifacts in City Hall, um, what about Market Wing? Um, what about uh, tours? Is that is that your team as well? That is our team. So Market Wing is part of our portfolio as well. And currently in that space is 36 questions that lead to loving Kingston. Oh, nice. Which is going to be wrapping up shortly in the spring. And it's a fun exhibition that visitors get engaged with and talk about uh, meaningful questions and answers that that kind of speak to their love and sometimes they're not love for Kingston. Okay, so get out and do that if you haven't yet. (laughs) And then, yes, we're also um, the team that provides the guided tours. We have a special, amazing team of volunteers that come and provide free guided tours from late May to early October every year. Um, And then during the off-season, when we have fewer visitors coming and the tour guides are kind of on hiatus, we have self-guided tour pamphlets in about nine different languages um, in the front front um, desk area as well as in market wing that visitors can grab. Incredible. I didn't realize the uh, tour guide process was volunteers. That's very interesting. Um, Okay. I just want to ask, um, too, about Heritage Hour. Um, That's a... It's not new, or is it new? Um, It's kind of reformed since the the pandemic, right? Heritage Hour is not new. It used to be called HRC Lectures, and we just um, changed the name, did a little bit of rebranding after the pandemic to open it to a wider audience. Mm -hmm. And so we bring in speakers, usually local community histories, to talk on their, speak to their topic and um, engage the community. We've seen some great turnout since we've started redoing them again. So with Heritage Hour, um, what what are some of the discussions that have taken place for some of the topics that you guys have covered? We've had a wide range of speakers at Heritage Hour, including a discussion about 36 Questions, the exhibit in Market Wing Cultural Space, talking about the cows of Kingston and um, (laughs) their mysterious disappearing acts. Incredible. Um, As well as a curator from the Museum Healthcare, Rowena, came out to talk, and we also had Chief Miracle at one of our discussions. Wow. So like really all over all over the map in a way in terms of topics, but centered on Kingston, I guess. Yeah, centered on Kingston and local community history. Okay. Um, So for those of you that are interested, you know, keep your eye out on city social media channels and advertising platforms. We'll have information when the next one gets confirmed. Um, Yeah, that's... That's great. So it sounds like there's a lot on the go, um, and it sounds like there's always 
always a lot on the go that this isn't unique for 2024. But I want to close by asking if there's something you're particularly excited about this year, or is there something that people should absolutely not miss out on, in your opinion? Going into 2024, I'm very excited for Soil Superheroes exhibition. We're going to be collaborating with some internal city um, departments, especially environmental operations managed by Brody Richmond. They've been recognized nationally and have been doing great groundbreaking work in soil management. So I'm really excited to be working with Brody and his team and just engaging with the community on soil so superheroes um, and the, the work the city is doing. I love the tie in with this traveling exhibit to environmental work that we're doing right now. It's so it's such a big topic and so relevant for the city. That's great. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I'm excited about it. Yeah. All right. Well, you heard it here first, maybe perhaps um, check out Soul Superheroes coming in early June. Um, yeah, so from paddle making to soil, public art to educational tours, there's a lot happening this year and every year at city museums and historical sites. There are lots of ways to stay connected with the work they do. Find and follow your favorite museums on social media or sign up through the city's newsletters for program updates and information. Uh, and as always, I want to remind listeners to check out our backlog if you haven't. Um, if you have any thoughts or episode ideas, we'd also love to hear from them. We read every email that we get. Uh, just send them to podcasts at cityofkingston.ca. And until next time, stay well, everyone. Thanks.